Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. On the show today, Shumi has lined up various categories of motorcycles from Kawasaki. We have got Suzuki's Maxi scooter for a road test. And Shumi answers your automotive queries on Auto Selector. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. This is Rohit Paratkar and for a change, I'm going to be hosting this episode of Overdrive because Sohini Dutt is up in the mountains enjoying the Independence Day, celebrating it with a bunch of Audis for the Independence Quattro Drive. In fact, that show comes up next week, so don't forget to tune in. Now, the weather isn't bad down here either, so much so that our team has been enjoying it with a bunch of two-wheelers. Now, speaking of which, have you ever wondered how platforms work? How different kinds of motorcycles can emerge from the same basic elements? Well, Shumi is going to tell you just that and helping him do that are going to be the four Kawasaki 650s. Take a look. When Kawasaki launched the Vulcan 650 in India, one story became possible. The story of the four Kawasaki's that belong to the same 650cc family. These motorcycles, the Z650, Ninja 650, Versus 650 and the Vulcan 650. Today let's talk about how they became sisters and brothers of each other, how Kawasaki created four different motorcycles from what is effectively the same platform. The family began in 2006 when the Kawasaki Ninja 650R came out and since then there have been updates as well as new family members. Today, all four siblings share a near identical liquid-cooled 649cc engine and I was shocked to see it but the exact same 6-speed gearbox and the same sprockets. And yet, when you ride them... The Ninja 650 and the Z650 are virtually the same motorcycle apart from the 6 kilos on the Ninja for the fairing. But when you ride this, it's such a dramatic difference because the lack of a fairing, the different handlebar, makes this feel lighter, more compact and more easy to control. But the important thing to understand is when you compare it for example to the Vulcan. Remember, all four Kawasaki's have exactly the same gearbox, all the ratios are the same. But can you imagine what the difference between riding the Vulcan and the Z650 is? Massive! There are slight differences in the engines of course. The Vulcan makes less power and torque but gets more torque low down whereas the Versys engine has the most horsepower to manage its heavier weight. And since the Ninja and the Z are one update cycle fresher than the other two, there are updates to their throttle bodies as well. But does their styling make a difference as well? Now we've got two motorcycles that are absolutely identical to each other. The Ninja 650 and the Z650. You'd be surprised at how much difference the fairing makes. Now obviously, wind blast is one thing, right? If you're out on the highway, you're going 120 steady, you're going to feel it and at 7 hours in, it hurts. This bike prevents that from happening by giving you a screen. But you'd be amazed at what a fairing like that does for you because when you sit here, the fairing's farther away from you and you get the sense that you're sitting on a larger, more comfortable machine. But look at the spec, it's exactly the same except for the 6 kilo difference that comes from the fairing between the Z and the Ninja. But if you look closer, the Z650 only differs from the Ninja in weight and has marginally more responsive steering geometry numbers as befits its role as a street naked. But they're so close in their real-world performance intent that Kawasaki can run virtually the same suspension on both of these motorcycles. But when you bring the Vulcan and the Versus, a cruiser and an adventure tourer into the picture, the differences in the suspension are more pronounced. After all, that's where a substantial part of the ability to do a bike's role comes from, right? I'm going to use Surprise, the Vulcan as an example to discuss the suspension on the four motorcycles. Which one do you think has the most suspension travel? The Versus does, exactly. But guess who comes in second when it comes to front suspension travel? That's the Vulcan. It's got 130mm of travel. Surprised? Well, that's because it's also got 31 degrees of rake versus 24 and 25 for the other bikes. And now that you've inclined this suspension to get wheel travel, an appreciable amount of wheel travel, you have to have longer travel in a diagonal line. 
That's how suspension is designed. This one needs to do a job for which the wheel needs to move a certain amount. But at this rake angle, Kawasaki has to give it longer travel. And at the other end of the Vulcan, the low slung design as well as the good road riding focus of the cruiser format shows in the 80mm of rear wheel travel. That's a lot less than all of the other motorcycles. And now, can you see a pattern emerging? Each component of each motorcycle, from styling elements to more serious parts like suspension, are added, removed or tuned to produce a specific benefit required for that motorcycle's role. It's a delicate exercise in packaging as well as cost management. The Versus is a good example of how packaging is done. If you look at the frame, there is one additional structural member that's arrived, but look at the package. They needed more ground clearance, it got 170mm versus 130 for all of the rest. It's got a taller seat height, the tallest here. It's got a tall handlebar, biggest fuel tank. But the most important thing is because the Versus has to do the hardest job of all of these three in terms of terrain, it's got the best suspension by far. It makes the Versus more expensive, but it makes it the best ride of all of these. And in fact, the Versus is better at ride than most of the motorcycles you can name in the Indian market. Now, since the four motorcycles actual performance is clustered pretty close together, I mean your horsepower range is 61 to 69 PS and your torque range is 63 to 66 Nm, the front brake specification, for example, can be extremely similar. But the Versus, the Adventure Tourer, can reasonably be expected to be ridden more often with luggage and or pillion. On the other hand, the Vulcan actually carries more weight on the rear wheel and therefore, the front wheel on the Vulcan only has a single 300mm front disc. But both the Vulcan and the Versus get a larger rear disc brake than the Ninja or the Z. Platforms allow manufacturers to use a slew of common parts to reduce cost. But clever engineering and design is required to make sure that each part that is different, that's cost and complexity added, produces a step in the direction of the role that the company has in mind for that final product. In Kawasaki's 650cc twin-cylinder family, remarkably similar engines and frames use small tweaks as well as large changes in crucial areas like suspension or the actual tyre used to produce motorcycles that feel very, very different from each other. I still find it amazing that Kawasaki and other manufacturers like Kawasaki can create such diverse experiences from what is effectively the same bowl of ingredients. The difference between riding a Versus, a Vulcan and a Z are so different from each other, it boggles the mind and so little changes with so much thought goes into it. Amazing, isn't it? Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive and we have Shumi with us who is going to answer all your queries on Auto Selector. The first query comes all the way from Merit from one Mr. Sonu Kumar Pandit who wants to buy a petrol crossover priced between 11 to 13 lakh. He shortlisted the Fiat Aventura and the Ford EcoSport S which is powered by the 1 litre EcoBoost engine. He wants to know which would be our choice. So no, first of all, let me just say I love the question. You want a turbo petrol. I assume you've got petrol running through your veins and that's exactly how we like it at Overdrive. You've selected two good cars to choose from. And from that perspective, just pick the car that makes you happier. That's how uh, performance is appreciated. That's how we buy cars that we really want to enjoy driving. Now, to more technical considerations, the Aventura powered by Abarth is a slightly more powerful car and that's the reason to buy it. But I think that the EcoBoost will actually make you happier. It's a more compact car, it's a peppier car in feel. That's the reason why I would say that the Ford EcoSport might actually be a better choice for you. But again, to me, if you're buying the car because of emotion, go test drive the car and buy the car that makes you feel better. If it's the Aventura, go for the Aventura. Our next query comes from one Mr. Tharak who is looking at buying a petrol automatic SUV. He is looking at the Hyundai Tucson or the Jeep Compass. Now apart from the regular criteria like safety, service cost and fuel economy, he also wants to know which is the better performer out of the two and he wants to keep the vehicle for over 10 years. So longevity is a big concern as well. What would be our choice? Tarak, get the Hyundai. You've put two points in there that absolutely totally focus the spotlight on the Tucson. The first is safety, it gets more airbags. And the second is reliability because you want to keep the car for 10 years. Hyundai has a bigger track record in India than Jeep and that's the only reason why I'm recommending the Tucson over the Jeep Compass. The reason to compare the Compass here would have been maybe off-road ability or you want to bash the car through off-road terrain, you need some of the ability on that side. But since that doesn't seem to be in your priority list, just get the Tucson. 
Our last query for the day comes from one Mr. Siddharth Shailar, who already drives a Maruti Suzuki Ertiga and wants to upgrade to an automatic. So he's looking at the Yaris CVT or the recently launched Brezza AMT. He wants to know which has the better ride quality of the two and overall, which is the car that we would recommend. The Yaris sounds correct for you because of two things. One is, uh, it's a comfortable car, you'll be happy inside it, big spacious cabin and you'll be able to drive around comfortably. The Brezza, it does have a very good ride quality but it is a slightly well damped, stiff, European kind of ride quality. If the Ortega is already bugging you, I don't think you'll be happy with the Brezza. Just get the Yaris, I think you'll be fine and it fits whatever parameters you've set out quite correctly. The only trade-off you make is the SUV stance of the Brezza but remember the Brezza is a crossover in that sense, not a genuine SUV, so the difference in ground clearance etc. is not all that major. Just get the Yaris, I think you'll, be, you'll do fine. Well, that wraps up Auto Selector. Let's quickly take a look at the important news that broke through the week. BMW is mulling bringing the M2 Competition Sports Coupe to the Indian market. Based on the 2 Series sedan, the M2 Competition borrows a 3 litre twin turbo 6 cylinder engine from the M4 but bumps up the output to 405 PS and 550 Newton meters. The engine will come with a dual-clutch automatic transmission which enables this compact sports car to sprint from standstill to 100 km an hour in 4.2 seconds compared to the regular M2's 4.4 second run. The top speed for the car is restricted to 250 km an hour by default or unlocked to 280 km an hour with the M driver's pack. The additional power is complemented by a carbon fibre strut brace and other such structural reinforcements to aid handling. We expect the car to go on sale around the upcoming festive season at a price tag of a shade under Rs 1 crore. Speaking of premium vehicles, Indian Motorcycles launched the Chieftain Elite early this week at an ex-showroom price of Rs 38 lakh. The Elite variant of this Chieftain premium bagger from Indian uses the same powertrain and is limited to 350 units worldwide. The Bluetooth-enabled infotainment and navigation system comes standard on this motorcycle. But what gives it the limited edition credential is a special high-flake silver paint that is inspired from the Black Hills mining region of South Dakota in the United States. Close on the heels of the Independence Day came announcements of a price hike from Mercedes-Benz and Maruti Suzuki. Citing the rising input cost as the reason for the bump up in pricing, Mercedes-Benz announced up to a 4% hike in ex-showroom prices across the range. Maruti Suzuki 2 increased ex-showroom prices across its model range by up to Rs 6,100 owing to similar reasons like rising input costs and the weakening value of the rupee and its subsequent drop in the exchange rates. Maruti Suzuki's hike in prices comes across both cars from the Maruti Suzuki Arena stables as well as those and the premium lineup from Nexa. Now, maxi scooters is a popular concept all around the globe, but not so much in India. But that could change with the Suzuki Bergman 125. Like we saw at the launch, it's an exciting scooter, loaded to the gills with features. In fact, Abhay went out road testing the vehicle and he has the story for you. Take a look. For the longest time, scooters in India have purely been about commuting from point A to point B, but we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel now, with manufacturers beginning to think beyond the humble family scooter. There's a bunch of performance-oriented scooters on sale currently and now Suzuki has just launched the Bergman Street in India. Well, to let you know, the Bergman Street is positioned as a maxi scooter, one that promises better styling and comfort than the average scooter on sale in India currently and is based on the hugely successful Access 125. Let's take a look. I'm happy to report that the Bergman Street is very different in terms of the design as compared to conventional scooters as we know them and it looks particularly appealing thanks to the long wheelbase and its low slung stance. A lot of the styling is inspired from the Bergman 200 and Bergman 400 that Suzuki sells internationally. What grabs your attention first is the wide front apron which makes the Bergman Street look larger than almost every scooter in the country instantly. The headlamp assembly is a large all-LED unit that also integrates daytime running lamps and looks imposing. The windscreen is a well-designed and well-positioned unit but serves a more cosmetic purpose here considering that the Bergman Street is just a 125cc scooter. Nestled behind the screen is the all-digital display that integrates the speedometer, fuel gauge and more. The handlebars are set low to make for a comfortable riding position though taller riders might find them a little too low. 
The floorboard is flat, but Suzuki has also designed the insides of the front apron in a way that riders can rest their feet at an angle, which makes for a comfortable posture on longer rides. The seat is long and low, which makes putting both feet down easy, and ergonomics on the Bergman Street have been designed thoughtfully. Underseat storage is the same as the Access 125, which is a bit of a disappointment, and I would have liked a larger storage area. The Bergman Street does get a glove box and a cubby hole up front, which offer decent storage space. The rear end looks good, thanks to the all-LED stoplight, and on the whole, the Bergman Street looks properly premium, also thanks to the high quality of materials used all around. The Bergman Street is powered by the same 125cc air-cooled single-cylinder engine as the Access 125. Now, we've always liked this engine for its high refinement. It sounds a little gruff on the Bergman, but it does feel very refined at all times. Performance is reasonably quick, considering that the Bergman is just 7 kilos heavier than the Access 125, and accelerating off the line, it feels very sprightly. Bottom end and mid range grunt are also reasonably good for what is a large maxi scooter, and overtaking in the city or simply riding through traffic is never an issue for this Suzuki. The crisp fueling helps offer a precise feel as well, which adds to the Patreon's credentials, and the Bergman's engine certainly lives up to the expectations we have from a manufacturer like Suzuki. But with that said, I would have liked some more grunt at the top of the rev range considering that the Bergman Street is positioned as more than just an urban commuter. Cruising at about 80 km per hour is not an issue, but I would have liked a slightly higher top end, considering that this is a maxi scooter. Coming from a manufacturer like Suzuki, the Bergman Street certainly impresses on the ride and handling front. Its telescopic folks might look spindly under that wide body work, but they certainly do a commendable job, be it in terms of soaking up bumps and potholes or offering high confidence levels when riding enthusiastically. The Bergman Street is mechanically identical to the Access 125, which means you have the same likeable feel from the chassis and suspension. The chassis inspires confidence when riding enthusiastically, while the telescopic forks and 12-inch front wheel together make for a sure-footed feel. The 90-section tyres at both ends offer lots of grip even in the wet, which adds to the Bergman Street's handling credentials, and on the whole, it feels sporty and fun to ride, despite its larger dimensions as compared to other scooters. What's more, the suspension offers a plush ride on most occasions and adds to comfort, while the seat is wide and accommodating and is also well cushioned, which makes it comfortable even on longer rides. The Bergman Street is also very impressive when it comes to braking. It uses a disc brake up front and a drum brake at the rear and gets a combined braking system as standard and the equipment makes for a very confident and reassuring feel every time you need to slow down or come to a halt. All said and done, the Bergman Street impresses on most fronts and leaves little room to complain. What's more, priced at Rs 68,000x showroom, it is not significantly more expensive than other 125cc scooters, especially when you consider the amount of equipment it gets as standard. In fact, it has the potential to revive the long-forgotten maxi scooter segment in India, and I'd also like to think that just like the Access 125, Suzuki has yet another winner at hand here. Well, that's it on this week's episode of Overdrive. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you have any feedback, suggestions or queries, do send them through to us. We are accessible on all the popular social media networks. As always, do check the overdrive.in website for all the latest happenings in the automotive world. And if you have missed out on any of our reviews, do tune in to the Overdrive YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Also, like I said, next week we have the IQD show lined up for you. So don't forget to tune in. Until then, goodbye, stay safe, drive safe, ride safe. Thank you.